Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome friends, this is the second lecture on the state and sovereignty and in this lecture we will start with uh, discussing very briefly about what is modern uh, nation state and then particularly we will focus on the three kinds or three major um, conceptualization of modern state from uh, liberal, Marxist and feminist perspective. So, we will discuss the liberal, Marxist and feminist conception of the state in the later part of this lecture. So, to begin with this um, modern state as we have discussed in our previous lecture is a modern development in terms of organizing a political institution which is impersonal that means uh, different from both the ruler and the rule and this kind of uh, political institution in terms of impersonal rule emerge only in the modern times. So, even a state as a political institution may have existed before the modern times, but the nature of that state was very personal. So, for example, uh, pre-modern state in India can be referred to say Mughal state or uh, Gupta's state or Ashoka's state and so on. So, we associate uh, the uh, uh, political authority or the state with a particular dynasty, with a particular ruler and so on. Only in the modern times, the state as an institution exists distinct from both the ruler and the rule. So, that is the one thing uh, which we have discussed and this emerged in the Europe after the um, 30 years of religious war especially after the Westphalia Treaty in 1648 and sovereignty is one such uh, defining characteristic of uh, state where within its own territory a state is regarded as the supreme institution. So, this discussion of a state we have had in our previous lecture. Uh, in today's lecture, we will see how this state in its association with the idea of nation and nationalism acquires a formidable status or power and authority in a given society and how the both uh, connects. So, all the uh, modern states then is also regarded as a nation state. So, in modern times every state is also considered as a nation state. So, Indian state is also Indian nation state or Pakistani state is also a Pakistani nation state or Bangladesh or so on and so forth. So, all the state in modern times also a nation state and uh, this first emerged in Europe and through colonialism and anti-colonial struggle as spread in different parts of the world. So, the expansion of modern nation state is um, uh, through this uh, colonialism and also the struggle against this colonialism. So, in the most part of Asia, Africa and Latin America, the state that emerged and the nationalism that evolved is the result of the anti-colonial struggle uh, also. Now, the relationship between the state and nation we can see as I have said that a state is an impersonal body. It is a kind of institution which is distinct from ruler and rule. But nation is a very subjective idea that means people emotionally in their psychological state believe or imagine themselves as part of something or a nation or a territory. Now, uh, this uh, rational abstract impersonal nature of state 
एंड ए वेरी सब्जेक्टिव साइकोलॉजिकल एंड इमोशनल स्टेज ऑफ नेशन और नेशनलिज्म इज समथिंग विच कम्स टूगेदर टू गिव्स द स्टेट द पावरफुल एंड द फॉर्मिडेबल ऑथोरिटी डेट इट इन्जॉय इन ए सोसाइटी इन ए पर्टिकुलर टेरिटरी सो वट वी सी इज स्टेट इज ए रैशनल एंड एबस्ट्रैक्ट एंटिटी सो एज ए सेट डेट स्टेट एज एन इंस्टीट्यूशन इज समथिंग विच इज रैशनल इम्पर्सनल एंड ऑल्सो एबस्ट्रैक्ट डैट मीन्स द बोथ रूलर एंड द रूल्ड is subject to this abstract entity which we call state and we have also made a distinction between state and the government so government may come and go we may vote certain party to power to form a government and we can also vote them out but the state as an institution is a kind of abstract entity which continue to remain continue to function even when government comes and go periodically so uh, state is then a rational and abstract entity or political institution here as nation is more about individual subjective association with a particular state so it's a very kind of personal uh, psychological and emotional association subjective association with a particular territory or uh, institution so as we have discussed in the previous lecture there is a degree of impersonality and abstractions with the state but the nation on the other hand is something which is rooted in the psychological and the cultural roots of the people so the nation becomes then a kind of legitimizing a kind of um, enabling power or enabling entity for the state and the power of the state in modern times is also associated with this idea of nation nationalism which makes the existence of a state very personal very subjective so the power of this idea of nation is so overpowering that people is more willing to get killed for this idea of nation or protecting their uh, nation from say external aggression from any kind of encroachment so people are willingly to die for that country or that nation than to get killed and their dying for that land or that territory or nation is something which is celebrated now from where comes the authority or power of this idea of nation where people are willing to get killed for protecting the nation or defending the nation than killing the other person so uh, the roots of the power and authority of this idea comes from the psychological and cultural roots or the subjective association of people with a particular uh, nationhood so there is lots of definitions and um, arguments about nation and nationalism which we are not going to discuss for our purpose uh, the objective is to understand how state as a impersonal abstract entity get intertwined with the idea of nation and nationalism and in modern times therefore all the nation all the states is regarded as a nation state where the characteristic of a nation and a state logically speaking differs from each other where one is abstract rational impersonal the other is more subjective psychological and emotional so nation and nationalism although very briefly is a modern phenomena and historically it also emerged in europe especially in the context of uh, industrialism industrialization or print capitalism and extended from there in different parts of the world and there have been different waves of nationalism so first in uh, europe you have civic or ethnic nationalism in the context of france and uh, germany we often make this distinction then there was the rise of eastern europe and their uh, assertion for self determination and latin america and then later on the anti colonial struggle in the asia and africa is the reflection of uh, different waves of nationalism in modern times which historically emerged in the europe nationalism also has a kind of inclusive and exclusive phenomena that means within a territory everyone that resides is part of that nation but it is also uh, something which excludes those who are not part of uh, that territory so the territory as for the state so is for the nation becomes a crucial determining 
factor for the constitution of the nation or the imagination of uh, the nation and it has created a lot of tensions, conflicts, wars and competition in the international So, uh, the modern historical or contemporary uh, uh, development in different parts, we have seen tensions or escalations on the borders uh, between two countries uh, in the name of protecting the territory or the border of a sovereign uh, nation state. So, First World War, Second World War or the Cold War and so on and so forth in different part of the world is the result of that uh, disputes which often comes from the border uh, or protecting the border of a nation state. So, this idea of nation and nationalism which is a modern idea emerged simultaneously with industrialization or print capitalism uh, gives a kind of subjective existence of the state. So, state which is impersonal, detached, uh, abstract entity in its combination with the nation or nationalism, people psychologically, emotionally associate themselves with the political organization in that in a particular territory. So, it remains one of the most powerful and legitimizing entity in modern world and there are numerous communities still fighting for the cert for the creation of their own nation. So, in many parts of even uh, a sovereign uh, nation state, you may find many communities, many groups still uh, fighting for creating their own nation. So, this idea and uh, the willing sacrifice for realizing this idea still motivates or inspire a number of communities in different parts of the world and therefore, by having one's own nation is also equal to having one's own identity as independent uh, or sovereign without any subjugation from the uh, external authority. So, uh, say when we were fighting the British, the uh, inspiring idea of or motivation for fighting the British was to have one's own nation and opportunity to express one's opinion independent of any external uh, control or uh, regulation. So, this assertion or the uh, idea of having independent voice without any subjugation of external authority is something which uh, continue to motivate many communities and groups in different parts of the world. It is also equal to uh, assertion of one's own independent identity. So, the power and legitimacy of modern state becomes formidable after its associations with a nation and nationalism, although the characteristics uh, definition of nation and state differ from each other, yet the coming together of uh, both gives the state enormous power and authority in a particular territory. So, and all states in modern times is also therefore regarded as a uh, nation states and um, that gives it a kind of formidable status. Now, to uh, look at briefly the three major conceptualization of a state, we will begin with this liberal idea of a state and a liberal conceptualization of a state. So, we will discuss a broader understanding of a liberal state and within liberalism you have different strands of uh, liberalism starting from liberal conservatism to liberal egalitarianism to uh, a kind of welfare oriented liberalism and so on and strong uh, libertarianism or multiculturalism also. But we are particularly focusing on the broader uh, conceptualization or uh, collective theorization among the uh, liberals about the modern state. So, in uh, liberal conceptualization of a state, we find that uh, the focus in this whole philosophy of liberalism is based on the idea of individual which is rational agent and capable of making uh, decisions that governs his or her life. Now, the whole uh, liberal philosophy is based on this idea of individual being rational capable of taking his uh, decisions that governs his life and a state, society or any other institution have no business in interfering in the matters that is concerning the individual. 
then why there is a need of a state? The need of a state is to ensure that the individual exercise maximum freedom or uh, there is no threat to his life or uh, property. So, in liberal philosophy broadly speaking, the idea is to ensure that individual rights are not violated. So, state is there to protect certain rights of the individual and second that individual gets the opportunity to exercise his freedom without any coercion, without any interference either from the state or from any other entity in the society. So, state in the liberal philosophy is uh, given a very minimal uh, role of maintaining law and order and ensuring that individual should get the condition to exercise his or her freedom more freely without any coercion and interference. So, that is the kind of overarching basic argument in the liberal conceptualization of a state. So, first it focuses on individual rights and freedom that is uh, absolute, it must not be interfered with, it must not be coerced or constrained. It also argues a neutral, that is a very crucial thing and minimal state, minimal state in terms of its role, what should be the role of a state? Should it be a nanny state as in the welfare um, state we have talked about that it should take care of the vulnerable society, weaker sections in the society or those who are dependent. A state should have a role to do that or a state should provide certain services like health, medicine, education and so on. Now, in the liberal philosophy, the idea of a state and its role is very minimal. A state should have a very minimum role of maintaining law and order. So, the reason data or the uh, very reason for the existence of modern state is to maintain law and order. That is their prime minimum responsibility. Now, often we see many states um, involving uh, in different activities, even in say uh, industrialization of a society or providing uh, education or medical care or so on and other kind of welfare program. But in the um, liberal understanding, the state has a very minimal role. The other feature of a state is a state is a neutral. This comes from this impersonal nature of the rule. So, a state must not take sides, a state must not be act or um, uh, form policy on behalf of a particular uh, groups in the society. So, a state as an institution is a neutral entity in the society. So, it is not uh, something which takes side when society and its groups are uh, competing with each other. A state must maintain a neutral uh, status from the competitive uh, groups in the society. So, this uh, conceptualization of state replaces the divine right theory of the state which um, justifies the existence of the state in the name of divine right. So, the king and his rule is legitimate because the king is representative of God on the earth. So, the very legitimacy why you should obey the king is based on the idea that he is the representative of God on the earth and therefore, you must obey the king. Now, this understanding of divine right of state is replaced by this idea that only that form of state is legitimate that is based on the consent of the people. So, in liberal understanding, um, the uh, legitimacy of the state is not because it maintains something or it does something, it has some other basis of its existence. The legitimacy of state in liberal philosophy is based on the idea that it is based on the consent of the people. So, the uh, consent of the people or those who are ruled. So, the legitimacy of the modern liberal state comes from the consent. So, that is why in most of the democratic liberal society, you have free and fair election periodically. That free and fair election periodically gives the mandate or the consent to a particular party to the form government or to rule the people. So, this idea uh, of rule based on consent of the people becomes the legitimizing idea for the government and not the divine right theory and on other functions that the government or state performs. So, a state then works for the common good of the society and not the good of any particular groups. 
So, state work for the common good of the society and its major activities understood as maintaining law and order. So, law and order is the condition. So, suppose if there is no law and order, there is anarchy, there is chaos and if there is anarchy and chaos, everyone's life and property is at stake and if the property and life is at stake, then there cannot be any progress, there cannot be any development. Nobody will trust and abide by the contract uh, if it is against his or her own interest. So, maintaining law and order is the minimum or the most crucial role of the modern state and ensuring everyone is treated with equality without any discrimination. So, this feature of modern state is also very modern liberal state is crucial that it treats everyone in the society equally. So, in most of uh, modern liberal democratic state, you get this idea that one man, one vote, one vote, one value. That means, it does not discriminate its citizen on the basis of either property or education or his or her status in the uh, society and its hierarchy. So, in caste, see caste ridden uh, hierarchical society in India, in social uh, arena, people are discussed. So, legally speaking, it is illegal, yet in the social structure of our society, people may have different status. But politically and legally, a Dalit or the upper caste or a prime minister or a rickshaw puller, they all have one vote and value of one vote is one. So, that is the kind of uh, equality and the whole legal uh, enterprise of uh, or legal structure of modern state is based on this idea that it treats all its citizens equally without any discrimination and that comes from the uh, impersonal or the neutral status of a state. So, in other words, a liberal state regards individual as moral and rational agent and a state's role is seen as providing them the conducive condition for the growth and prosperity. So, the role of a state is not really to involve in industry, to uh, work for development and so on. In liberal idea, the ideal state is that state which provide law and order and ensure the condition where individual can exercise his freedom that will lead to the growth and prosperity in the society. So, it is uh, the origin and the growth of liberal state can be traced back to the political struggles that took place in England and France with the rise and growth of capitalism which led to free market economy. So, uh, in modern times in Europe, there was a growth of mercantile capitalism under the absolutist monarchy. Now, uh, these uh, mercantile capitalists wanted the monarch to provide them certain security and with that security, they uh, conducted trade and business uh, in far away places. Now, gradually there is a rise of middle class in the society and that middle class gradually demanded more and more rights, more and more accountability, more and more transparency from the government and that lead to a new kind of discourse about political authority in the society, which leads to a constitutional representative form of government. So, this idea of liberal state emerged in the England and France. These struggles focused on the first individual dignity, self-interests, private property and power and status particularly of the emerging middle class in the society. So, all these things that oh, what matters in life is the dignity. It must be recognized and respected by the state and others. Their property, uh, what moves the individual is the interest, self-interest or acquiring uh, wealth and state must give them protection to live the life with dignity to uh, conduct trade or business without any coercion, without any threat and so on. So, this coming of liberal state, there were significant changes occurring in the political organization of the society, like you have the representative government or representative form of government or the constitutional form of government. So, the government, unlike a monarchy, is not free to do anything that it wishes to do the government must functions within a parameter and that parameter is set by constitution and rule of law. 
So, in a democracy when a ruler is elected, that ruler is not free like the monarch to do anything that he or she wishes to do. Ruler must function within the rule of law or what is the constitution of that country. So, this idea of a representative form of government that government is only legitimate if it represents the will of the people or if it has the consent of the people. So, that is one and once they are elected they must function within a set parameters that is set by the constitution or rule of law. So, the ruler and ruled are both governed by a particular set of parameters that is the constitution and rule of law. So, uh, the government based on the consent of the rules, these are some of the new ways of organizing the political institution or authority in the society which leads to creation of a modern liberal democratic state. So, it is stressed on a new discourse on rights to uphold the natural rights and basic rights of humans like right to life, property, freedom, justice and so on. So, these are the rights which state is supposed to protect for the individual. Adam Smith, a liberal thinker, emphasized on the individual urge to maximize economic interest or to achieve material gains and thereby to improve their uh, living standards or fortune. So, the motivation for the individual is to work or to take decisions uh, which is economic or material governing his or her life. Now, Smith argued that if a state provides the condition of freedom to individuals to take material and moral decision concerning his or her life, the resulting society would be a free and prosperous society. So, why uh, we need a free society? Because free society ensures or provides the conditions to the individual to take decisions which is material or moral that governs his or her life. So, that society which is free and provides the condition for taking decisions about the material and the moral matters to the individual will be a prosperous society. So, the whole justification of free market economy or free society is based on the idea that if a society and economy give freedom to its individual, the resulting society would be a more uh, prosperous and free society. So, he talks about a free market economy and less interference by the state in the functioning of that free market economy. So, uh, Adam Smith, the wealth of nation um, argues about a society or creating a society and a state which will have no interference or less interference in the matters that affect the moral and material life of the individual. In other words, the individual should be left free to take moral and material decisions concerning his or her life. And if that is uh, the condition, then the resulting society would be a more uh, prosperous and wealthy society. So, for liberals in general, therefore, they also uh, most of the liberal thinkers or philosophers, they will argue for the protection of a free market economy and commerce and trade in their assessment would create a good and welfare oriented government in the society which will work for the benefit of all without taking the side, without uh, being prejudiced or biased against a particular community or group of individual. So, uh, commerce and trade is uh, conducive for a good and welfare oriented government according to the liberals. Now, for uh, liberals then the role of a state is to carry out a legal framework under which market can function well. So, the market here means the idea of free market. So, there should not be any uh, regulation or interference in the functioning of market because uh, it is understood in liberal philosophy that market has its own laws of uh, which we call says law of demand and supply. So, demand and supply is uh, guided by the demand. If demand is high and supply is low, price will be high and vice versa. If demand is less and supply is more, the price will be less. So, market in this assessment has its own logic or its own uh, self-regulating mechanism which we call invisible hand of market. Now, the state in 
this kind of economy must refrain from interfering or regulating the functioning of market. The idea is to ensure that the contract is followed by the party uh, involved in that contract. So, the state has uh, a very minimal role to create a legal framework under which market can function well without interfering, without regulating the market. So, market should be left free, but its operation should be under a legal framework where uh, the contract or the party involved in the contract must abide by the terms of that contract. And if they do not, there is a state to arbitrate. So, that is the role of a state in uh, regulating, in supervising the functioning of market without any uh, interference, without any direct control. So, and it should also maximize the opportunities and prosperity for everyone and a state should thus focus for adjudicative or the legal rules. So, liberal argues that citizens have the right to overthrow government. So, in liberal idea that um, overthrowing the government is the right of the citizens if the government fails to fulfill the desired rules and functions such as creating condition for human happiness and well-being. Suppose if a government fails to maintain law and order, so citizens have every right to throw that government out in the next election. So, in all uh, liberal democratic state, elections are held periodically in 4 years, 5 years or 6 years and the citizens have the right to throw the government if that government do not perform to their satisfaction for their benefit or uh, happiness or well-being. So, in uh, conclusion, we will find that liberals wanted to ensure maximum freedom to individuals and therefore regard the state as necessary evil. So, it is a kind of uh, limit or restrains the uh, individual and his freedom, but this restraint and limit to individual freedom is regarded as necessary evil because a state ultimately provides the condition or ensure law and order which helps or which provides the conducive condition for the individual to grow, to develop, to innovate or to exercise his freedom. So, uh, the idea is to have or to ensure maximum freedom to individual and yet a state is seen as a kind of necessary evil. As for them, without a legal authority in the form of a state, individuals lives and property will be under constant threat. And if the lives and property of the individual is under constant threat, that would be detrimental to peace, progress and prosperity of the society. And therefore, you need a state even if it is evil, even if it limits or restrains your activities. Thus, the state in liberal framework should perform the minimum role of maintaining law and order and enforcing contract. It will lead to overall progress of individuals and society as well. So, that is the conception of a liberal state. Now, moving on to the Marxist conception of a state which is in contrast to the liberal idea of a state, where a state is not seen as impersonal or neutral. In fact, Marxist argument is that a state is a kind of or a tool of exploitation in the hands of one class against the other. So, they focuses on the class nature of the modern state. So, modern state in contrast to the liberal conception of a state according to Marxist is not a, a neutral state, not a impersonal state. In fact, a state functions on behalf of uh, a particular class to protect their interest against the interest of the majority. So, Marxist focuses on the class nature of the modern state and in their conceptualization, a state is seen as an instrument of exploitation in the hands of one class against the other. So, the Marx idea on a state was put forward as a counter idea to Hegel's notion of a state. So, we will discuss this Hegelian notion of a state. For Hegel, as we have discussed in our previous lecture also, that a state is seen as a kind of march of God on the earth. So, the ethical life or realization of ethical life according to Hegel is possible only in a state. So, Marx was not supportive of this Hegelian idea of a state which is guided by universal will. So, we will discuss this idea what is this universal will. So, let us say there is a particular will then there is the selfish um, 
so there is a three stages that we will discuss. The universal will when individual functions and operates uh, on the will or on the idea that their action is for the benefit of all and not for their own self or the, uh, the interest of their own uh, groups or communities. So, when individual action is governed by the universal will that means the benefit of the uh, whole humanity, the whole uh, uh, people that uh, uh, ensures the realization of ethical moral life in the state. Uh, Marx questions this idea of universal will and the uh, state functioning for the benefit of all. Marx thought of a state as an institution that serves the dominant capitalist class which he explains in Communist Manifesto. Now, coming back to these three idea or three stages, Hegel argued about these three different spaces, spaces or stages or levels of social existence or individual growth that starts from family, civil society and state. Now, in family, we are all willing to sacrifice for the members of other family. So, we are guided by a kind of altruistic will where we want to sacrifice our share for the sake of other members of our family that a kind of very limited but yet altruistic sphere of individual life. Then there is a life in civil society where we are guided by the particular or the selfish interest. So, we uh, act in civil society to maximize our own selfish interest. And finally, is the state is the representative of universal will where we are guided by the idea of benefiting the all and not merely our own self or our own uh, groups or communities. So, in Hegelian idea of progression, these three stages is necessary to realize a moral and ethical life and to enhance or realize one's freedom. But Marx never saw such a scope for individual ethical development under state. Rather, he says that individual freedom is curtailed under a capitalist state because it functions on behalf of, on behest of a uh, particular class and their interests. So, Marx focused on the coercive and the authoritarian nature of capitalist state and for him state brought division of society into different classes on the basis of their ownership of wealth and power. So, usually in Marxist analysis uh, society is divided between those who own the means of production and therefore bourgeoisie and those uh, whose very survival is dependent on working uh, or they do not own the uh, means of production and they are the majority or proletariat. So, uh, this division of uh, society in a capitalist economy led Marx to argue in Communist Manifesto that the modern or uh, the exact line is that the executive of the modern state is but a committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie. So, the state is seen as a um, instrument in the hands of those who own the means of production and a state always protect and promotes the interest of that class against the interest of the proletariat. So, that is one uh, view on a state in Marx which uh, is also matured and which comes later in a communist manifesto. But in Marx there is also one or second view of a state which is in the 18th premiere of Louis Bonaparte where uh, he talks about a kind of relative autonomy of the state. So, in the social classes, a state managed to impose its will on all the classes in the society. So, uh, a state in that kind of society may appear a bit autonomous from the classes. So, uh, in uh, uh, communist manifesto, we have seen that a state is controlled by the classes which owns the means of production that is bourgeoisie. Here in 18th Brumaire, we see uh, the explanation of a state as a relatively autonomous state which is uh, free or autonomous from the control of any classes in the society and has the capacity or capability to impose its will. But this capacity or ability to impose its will is not absolute and in the long run, a state continues to 
protect and promote the interests of the bourgeoisie. This Marx argued that in a class divided society, a state cannot promote the interests of all. He believed that a capitalist state can be overthrown therefore by a revolution by the proletariat or working class. The capitalist uh, state would then be replaced by what he calls socialist state under the dictatorship of proletariat, which would eventually lead to a classless and stateless society. So, that is the overall uh, um, vision and objective of creating a society which will not be divided into property or those who do not own the property have or have nots or bourgeoisie or the proletariat. So, that would be a kind of classless society which will uh, no longer need a, a state to govern itself. Now, uh, the uh, third and the final conceptualization of state for today's lecture is the feminist uh, conception of a state, which focuses on um, this claim of a state to be a neutral institution. So, feminism questions the neutrality of the state, which is blind to the gender based discriminations women's conditions in the public and private spheres, the political rights, equal distribution of resources, rights to equality with men and so on. So, a state in its claim to neutrality according to feminists are blind to the gender discriminations or the unequal distributions of resources or unequal access to the uh, services in public and private spheres of uh, social life. So, feminist questions the state neutrality which perpetuates, which do not uh, resolve this uh, discrimination on the basis of gender in the society or in the public sphere. So, feminists are interested in analyzing the state's role or its intervention in dealing with women's issue and concerns like gender discrimination in society. Now, uh, we have discussed in one of our lecture on power or the feminist conception of power, within feminism there are uh, different opinions. So, uh, starting from liberal to a Marxist to a radical feminism, you see a range of uh, debates and discussions about creating a just society, which would be gender just as well. So, there is a kind of multiple voices within feminism. Radical feminism most crucially argued about not just the questioning the neutrality of the state and uh, demanding equal respect or equal uh, legal and political rights, but it characterizes the uh, state as a patriarchal state, where the dominance of male is extended from family to the society to the state and all the decisions or the policies are framed or the positions are held only by the male and there is this question of preferential or the reservation for uh, women and so on. They are against them class exploitations and inequalities existing in a liberal state. So, they believed discrimination and inequality or disparity between men and women lies in family. So, that is the source of a patriarchal state which radical feminist argued about and particularly in the organization or a structure of labor within family which extend in the outer world of society and state as well. So, uh, the extension of gender discrimination that exists in the family is extended in the sphere of society or state as well. So, feminism characterizes a state as biased in terms of administrative structures or organs or institutions of governance which reflects the hierarchy that exists in society and uh, gender relationship in public arena. So, the state is uh, regarded uh, or characterized as biased in terms of its administrative structures, organs and system of governance, which reflects the hierarchy that exists in society and gender relationship in public arena. So, they view men or male as taking over offices or recruitment in government jobs where men's dominance is prevailing and their decisions and interest determining how power is exercised through different organs or institutions of the state. So, most feminists believe that gender subordination 
is true for all classes, all societies, all households and more precisely it is prevalent across economic classes in the world. Now, feminists are also very critical uh, against the liberal state and its dichotomy of public and private sphere. So, the basis of a liberal state is this distinction between private and the public. Now, private uh, space is regarded as a space where a state must not uh, form law and individuals should have uh, maximum freedom. Only the matters concerning the public state can legally regulate and limit certain activities of the individual that is related to the public life. So, state as an institution is about maintaining, regulating or ensuring law and order in the public life. So, the organization of polity rests on this dichotomy between public and the private life where individual enjoy maximum freedom in his private life, but his public life can be uh, regulated or restrained on reasonable grounds by the state. Now, uh, feminist questions this dichotomy between public and the private and assert the personal is political. So, in this liberal dichotomy, family is seen something as the matter of uh, private and therefore, a state should not interfere into that. Now, feminist question this dichotomy and argue that family as an institution is where the discrimination between men and women is practiced, perpetuated and reproduced and that perpetuation, practice and reproduction of gender discrimination in the family extended in the realm of society and state and therefore, we cannot keep the family outside the realm of political. So, even the emotions, feelings, love and a lot of other uh, uh, feelings which is regarded as personal or the private matter is questioned by the feminist and the asset that personal is political. So, this understanding of uh, political where the personal or the private is also seen as part of political radically alter the understanding of politics and the rules of a state and a state policies according to feminism which believes in this dichotomy of public and private fails to resolve issues like domestic violence, less income for working women, unequal responsibilities of women at home that limits their activities outside. So, therefore, feminists are demanding certain rights such as reproductive rights, abortion rights, subsidies for birth control and so on. So, in other words, feminism bring gender at the center of discourse on politics and state and strive towards creating a society which is just or family, society and state which is gender just society. So, the idea or uh, the realization of liberty, equality and justice is not possible unless the gender justice is also ensured and that is the contribution of feminism towards uh, understanding of politics and state and its role in creating a society which is not just uh, legally and politically just for half of the population that is only for male, but also includes and ensure the participation and empowerment of female or women. So, with this we conclude this lecture where we have discussed the um, idea of modern nation state and how these two seemingly opposite kind of um, uh, institution or entity comes together to acquire a formidable status in a particular society or territory. Uh, and then we discuss the liberal, Marxist and the feminist conception of a state. So, on these uh, lectures or these themes, you can focus some of these readings like Rajiv Bhargav, Martin Connery and John Hapman and Paul Graham and Rod uh, Deborah on the feminism and state. So, these are readings for today's lecture. Thanks for listening. Thank you all.